What is up? And welcome back to Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers. As always, I am your host, Brandon Silvers. We are talking men's college hoops today, but first, hope you had a great week. Also, shout out to everyone who checked out my blog slash newsletter. The show notes wrote about my experience at the South Carolina UConn women's game and did a breakdown of my favorite songs from Gamecocks women's basketball celebrity fam plies. It's a mix of different topics heavy on pop culture. So if that sounds interesting to you, a link to the show notes site will be in the show notes down below, whether you're listening to this or watching on YouTube. Now, we're used to Dawn Staley's Gamecocks women's team being at or near the top of the national rankings. What's surprising is what the men's team is doing in Columbia. Coach Lamont Paris, in just his second season at the school, is currently leading the men's team to its best regular season since the days of Melvin Watson and B.J. Mackey. This is a team that had such a miserable year last year, they were picked to finish last in the SEC coming into this one. This should be an exciting time for me. Outside of the women's basketball program, my Gamecocks fandom has resulted in me pulling for teams that cycle between being bad and mediocre, yet here I am barely caring. So this could just be what it's like being a Gamecocks fan. But as I zoomed out, it hit me that I really haven't been following men's college basketball at all the way that I usually do. And as someone who refuses to take personal responsibility, I sought out anecdotal evidence to confirm that I was not alone in that and the problem was indeed with college basketball itself. So let's talk about men's college basketball's identity crisis, what caused it, and should we be concerned? Okay, sports fans like stars, something that stands out, whether it's players, coaches, teams, doesn't matter. We either want to pull for them or against them, but stars make us care. The antithesis of this is parity. The more equal players and teams are, the less star power there is. That's why my theory is that when fans say we want more parity or more teams with a chance to win, we don't actually want that. What we really mean is that we want our team to have a better chance at winning. Following this line of thinking, my initial thought was that this new NIL and transfer portal era has created more parity in the sport, and that's why I care less than I did before, because players can move and want to move and talent is spread out more evenly. This has created a logjam of contenders, and I'm too lazy, along with everyone else who shares my feelings about this, to sort through who's good and who's not, so to save myself the trouble, I simply don't care. What do the numbers have to say about this? Well, the 2023 data hasn't been released yet, but according to a study the NCAA put out, there was a significant increase in transfers when they first loosened up the rules in 2021, but things have leveled out pretty well to a point where the number of D1 men's basketball transfers actually decreased slightly going from 2021 to 2022. But even with things finding a settling point, there has been a lot of movement. So how has that movement affected the landscape of college basketball and the programs we typically expect to see at the end of March Madness? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm ready to talk about it. Since 2004, we've had 19 national championships won by 10 different schools. Seven of those schools are currently in the top 25 at the time of this recording, including five in the top 15, with last year's national champion UConn currently at number one. Only Villanova, whose coach Jay Wright retired, and Louisville, who had their title vacated for NCAA violations and 15-second man Rick Pitino run out of town as a result, have had significant drop-offs in success. Even outside of national champions, there haven't been any major shakeups in the polls that are outside of the cyclical nature that we're used to. Teams are good and they reload so they can remain good. The transfer portal has just offered up an additional way to reload that's more likely to reinforce the hierarchy than it is to shift it. Think about what the most talented players look for in schools. What place gives them the best shot at making the NBA? Who has the most NIL money? Where can they win? If you want these things, you're gonna go to a traditional powerhouse. Now, while the transfer portal hasn't changed who the good teams are, it has changed how they operate. The flip side of being able to attract all this talent now is that that talent can also lead for better opportunities. So if you're a coach at one of these schools, how do you stop that from happening? by balancing the opportunity they have at your program the best you can. Minutes, shots, whatever gets distributed as equally as possible so they stay, their pro prospects 
prospects remain intact and you keep winning and attracting great players. The unintended consequence this has is it makes it less likely for a single player to put up the types of numbers that would make us consider them a star, which again is a problem because we like stars. So that affects my fandom personally a little bit, but there are some players who do put up numbers on good and even great teams, so why aren't they stars? Well, that comes down to how we define stars in college basketball. Putting up great numbers helps, being on a great team helps, but it's hard to truly be considered a national college basketball star without the potential for stardom in the NBA. There is no better example of this than Purdue's Zach Eady. Last year as a junior, he answered the question, is he good at basketball or is he just seven foot four? By showing that he is indeed good at basketball, which is kind of underselling it. Think of all the great college basketball players there have been. Michael Jordan, Christian Leitner, Shane Battier, Patrick Ewing, Tim Duncan, Tyler Hansbro, whoever. They each won the Naismith Player of the Year Award once. Those are guys who played three or four years. You have to go back over 40 years to Ralph Sampson to find someone who has won it multiple times. The Wimby before Wimby as KP sat right here on this show and explained. Sampson was big time a national college superstar who was an NBA star as well before injuries ended his career. Zach Eady is well on his way to winning his second Naismith Award in a row. Again, the first time in 40 years it's happened, something that all those other all-time greats didn't do. On top of that, he has Purdue poised to be a number one seed again, ready to avenge last season's embarrassing tourney exit when they lost to a 16 seed. And despite this incredible historic historic resume, nobody cares. By every measurement of what a star should be, Edie fits or exceeds it. Almost literally larger than life, skilled, gaudy stats, awards, great team, but you have not grabbed your remote to put on a Purdue game for the sole purpose of seeing Zach Eady once this entire season. And I can't blame you because neither have I because he's not going to be a star in the NBA. He's certainly more skilled and better able to contribute at the next level than the previous Giants that have come before him, the Kenny Georges, the Taco Falls, the Hashim Thabits. But that's a very low bar to clear for such a big dude. It's a weak draft this year, so he might go in the first round, but with the way the NBA game is played today, can you even begin to imagine the words NBA MVP Zach Eady? Or hell, even NBA All-Star Zach Eady? No, I have a better chance imagining myself being seven foot four. It's the same issue that other players who fit the star criteria of being the man on a great team face. UNC's RJ Davis, Arizona's Caleb Love, Kansas's Kevin McCullough Jr., or Hunter Dickinson, all great players on great teams, but they all look like future NBA role players at best. On top of that, we're sick of them. Like Edie, the players I just mentioned are all seniors, and we've been conditioned, again thanks to this NBA potential lens, to think about college basketball seasons the same way we think about dog years. The better you are, the quicker you go to the league, so players who stick around more than a year or two, no matter what their stats say or what your eyes tell you, aren't good. They're merely great college players. The COVID year has only made this issue even worse. Do you know how loudly I sigh when I see this generation's Perry Ellis, Tar Heel big man Armando Baycott pop up on my TV? He's about to turn 24 and I treat him like he's Udonis Haslam. College seniors just don't make exciting NBA draft prospects. The last college senior to go number one overall in the NBA draft was Tim Duncan, who only stayed all four years because he promised his late mother he would. He graduated from Wake Forest when Bill Clinton was in office. When it comes to men's college basketball, we do not respect our elders. That gap, that star player gap has been filled by the young guys. The diaper dandies, as Dickie V would scream. Hell, even some sophomores. Come see Zion, John Wall, Michael Beasley, Ben Simmons. Yes, he was a draw in college. Trey Young, insert player here while you have the chance before they move on to the NBA which is where we see another instance of this lack of star power pop up. Not only are guys drawn to more stacked teams that share the wealth so they can't put up star numbers, but we've also seen the number of freshmen who come in ready to play a starring role decrease over the past couple seasons. 
You have to go all the way back to the 2009 Blake Griffin draft to find a freshman class that didn't have a clear-cut top three pick contender. Tyreek Evans was the first freshman picked at number four in that draft, and even he went on to win Rookie of the Year. There's still plenty of time left for guys to move up draft boards and develop as players, but who in this freshman class can you picture getting up to the top three right now? Which freshman would you pick to win Rookie of the Year next year? Rob Dillingham, Isaiah Collier, Cody Williams, Trace Matthews. Trace Matthews doesn't even exist. I just made him up. If I gave you a dollar for every real freshman prospect you can name right now, where are you eating tonight? So you have them going to more stacked teams when they're not putting up these big numbers. You also have them not being quite as good this year. They also have more post high school options such as Overtime Elite and G League Ignite. Those leagues are siphoning away players who would have otherwise most likely have been impact players in college in a way that reminds me of how high school players being able to enter the NBA draft affected college basketball back in the day. So you have a smaller talent pool available off the top because of that. And this season in particular, the talent pool isn't nearly as talented. So we effectively have no stars. We have guys we don't know and guys we know too well. But that shouldn't matter if the programs that have always been good are still good. I mean, college sports fandom is more team-based anyways, so even though we love stars, we should be fine as long as we recognize the teams, right? Yes, except we don't recognize these teams. And we don't recognize them because we don't recognize the coaches. They're who cultivate the program identity in the first place. Not only do they recruit based off their vision of their program, but they're simply around longer. The NBA is player centric. My current favorite team to hate, the Milwaukee Bucks, is a great example of why this is. They have a superstar in Giannis who makes them title contenders. They pay him a ton of money and they build their roster around him. He's been there over a decade and he could, in theory, stay there his entire career another decade if he wanted to. If you're a GM of another team and called and asked to trade for him, they wouldn't even give you Thanasis because they want to keep Giannis happy. He means that much. Compare that to how they treat his coaches. He's had three coaches since this time last year. His last coach was fired months into the job because Giannis didn't like him or his system. The coaches are infinitely more expendable than the players at that level. They make way less money and you don't have to try to trade them or anything. Goodbye, we'll pay you to stay home, which is a great job if you can get it. NBA head coaches are expected to come in, adapt their system to the personnel, make the stars happy, and that's it. Now compare that to a college program. If Giannis magically got NCAA eligibility and decided to go use every last second of it at the College of Charleston, we'd all be on George Street every game for the next four years. It'd be an awesome four years. They might win four straight titles. Who knows how many records he would break. Other great recruits would come join him. But when that clock is up, if they've been telling everyone, come see Giannis, come see Giannis, what are they going to do? Giannis is gone. He's leaving. They have a set end date. The coach will most likely still be there though. Coaches have that Giannis power at this level. Even with the dynamic shifting, they recruit the players, the players have to make them happy, and the players have to fit into their system. When I say the words Duke basketball, you think Coach K. Christian Leitner had one of the greatest college basketball careers we've seen in modern history, but it was a four-year resume compared to a 42-year resume. Leitner never stood a chance. I mentioned Jay Wright earlier, but we've also lost Coach K, Roy Williams, even Jim Beheim to retirement in the past three seasons, the top three leaders in Division I coaching wins, and three guys who built programs in their identity. I didn't have to know who was on Duke's roster. They didn't have to have names at all. I knew that no matter what, when I turned a Duke game on, they were going to have a pasty white guy who I was going to hate. I knew when I watched Syracuse, Bayheim was going to be knuckle deep in his nose on the sideline watching his team run that same tired 2-3 zone. I knew Roy Williams' Tar Heels were going to play like Dean Smith was still coaching, except much faster and crashing the boards much harder, and Roy might faint. Those are two of college basketball's most important programs, plus Syracuse, and we really don't know who they are anymore. Duke's still a top 10 team. They even made one of those pasty white guys the head coach. But who are they? Their best player is a pasty white guy, and I don't think anybody even hates him. Same with North Carolina. We know Hubert Davis loves his white wife so much that he lets her cut his hair, and it feels like Baycott was there under Bill Guthridge. But who are they? 
Now, legendary coaches have always retired, but that problem is being compounded by the amount of coach movement in general. Administrations have less patience than they did in previous generations. If results don't come quickly enough, they don't hesitate to move on. And if you do show promise at a school that isn't at the top of the college basketball world, then you're looking to move on too so you can climb that mountain. Will we ever see a coach do what Mark Few has done at Gonzaga ever again in an environment where a Lamont Paris who coaches in the SEC is already in rumors to leave for a quote unquote bigger program? Building a program takes time and everyone's in a hurry to leave. The good news about everything I've talked about up to this point is that it's either cyclical or it just requires a transition period. We will get a talented freshman class again over Tom Elite and G League Ignite are the shiny new things now, but they have a long way to go to replace college basketball as the best path of getting to the NBA, especially with NIL money being an option. The COVID year will go away. Armando Baycott will graduate. We'll learn to hate Duke's pasty white guys again. New iconic coaches will replace the ones we've lost and 10 years will start to get a little bit longer as the coaches we have will get better at figuring out roster management in this NIL transfer portal era. And most importantly, on top of all that, there's always March Madness. No matter how little you care during the regular season, you cannot help but tune into one of the most exciting sporting events we have, an event that isn't necessarily exciting due to the players or the coaches or the programs involved so much as the nature of the event itself. You don't have to know anything about what's gone on to fill out a bracket and watch the games and pull for upsets. Over the course of the tournament, all the things I just talked about go out the window. It is the thing that trumps everything else. Just like when you think of Coach K, when you hear the words Duke basketball, you think of March Madness when you hear the words college basketball. As long as the NCAA has that tournament in that format, they can survive all the other stuff. They keep talking about expanding to make more money because that's just what they do. But as long as they set aside three weeks in March for a one and done tournament to see who the best team is, they'll probably weather that greedy ass storm too. So we've got a couple weeks left to get locked in, watch some conference tournaments and pretend to be experts only to have our brackets cooked by the first weekend. And I cannot wait. All right, this has been another episode of Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers. Thank you for watching, listening, subscribing, rating, reviewing, and sharing. Don't forget to check out the blog, The Show Notes, in the episode show notes down below, and I will catch you later. Later.